she's rocking. Dance the smoke. So what does the Concorde mean to you? Oh, it, it did something really special. Um, um, I was lucky enough to, to fly on Concorde in the mid-1980s, um, which is one of those experiences that I've had in my life that I'll never, ever forget. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'm not an enormous... Um, aviation fan you know I don't go plane spotting I don't stand at the end of the runway at Stansted and sort of say oh look that's a 737 or something but to fly on Concorde was was really special um, and and I'm I kind of understand why it isn't in service but at the same time I think it's a great shame okay uh, what was your experience of it like when you went on it for the first time <sighs> well it's much smaller than you think it's going to be um, I mean, the plane itself is really long, um, but the, but on board there's only a hundred seats, and the aisle you know is narrow, and there's only like two seats on either side of the aisle, so it's four seats across, and the seats are all grey leather. Well, they were on the Concorde I went on, unless they were yeah, and they're not really good for l how shall I put this delicately larger people. Um, you know, because the seats are all the same size, and I I was sitting next to a. a, a I was actually sitting next to the managing director of Warner Brothers, okay, when I was on this plane. And he, at the time, so he was a, a big gentleman, all right, I'm putting it delicately. And he was squashed into the seat. And I was pinned up against the window. Um, but it's such an amazing experience. Um, we flew to Iceland and back. Um, we didn't land. Well, we took off from Heathrow and landed again at Heathrow. It was just a kind of what they what they called in the old days. They used to call it a jolly. You know, uh, we were taking a load of uh, a load of important film people uh, for a day out, essentially. Um, but it was just so exciting. Um, we, we when we took off, it was like being flung out of a catapult. You know, I mean, literally, like you know, being shot into the sky. Um, and then because the the, the conditions were perfect. Um, we were, we were very, very lucky. And so the only sort of civilian passengers ever, I think, in the history of aviation um, to travel at Mach 2, um, which is twice the speed of sound. And I, I actually I hate myself for this, but I had a certificate saying I've traveled at Mach 2 signed by you know, British Airways, which I've lost, which is just so an example of how dumb I am. But that's 1,500 miles an hour. I mean, you can feel it. You can feel the pressure. You can feel the speed. And the other thing that was amazing about it was that we we were flying at 65,000 feet um, because obviously the air is much thinner. So the, the, the plane, I'm not an expert in the physics, but at that height, there's less um, resistance. So the plane can go even faster. Um, but at 65,000 feet, you're kind of not far from the edge of space. Um, and the sky goes from the kind of light blue that we know from you know being stuck on the ground and we look up to this kind of aquamarine almost kind of night n n dark kind of ghostly blue and you can see the spectrum of color as you as you're flying and so it's like you're kind of flying down a tunnel which has got you know the earth on one side and space on the other and you can see both it was a, it was an extraordinary experience and i'm, I'm very very lucky to have had it On World News tonight this Tuesday, the first Concorde ever to crash just after takeoff from Paris. 113 people are killed, which included everyone on board. It is the world's most glamorous passenger aircraft.
take a closer look. What's the magic, and what will this crash mean to Concorde's future? Well, it was very, I remember it was Toulouse, wasn't it? it? It happened in Toulouse in the south of France. And it was very shocking. Um, and because Concorde was such an iconic um, plane, it got a huge amount of um, media coverage. Um, I think... I'm not, I don't know for sure, but my feeling is, is that Concorde wasn't particularly cost effective. Um, and therefore, when it crashed and there was the terrible fallout from that and the loss of, terrible loss of life and the, the extreme media coverage, I think they felt that it simply was cheaper not to, not to go on. With all these things, it's about money not about human life and because it couldn't carry that many passengers and because it was very um it used a lot of fuel let's put it that way <laughs> um i think it was just a decision to to basically save money and do you think it will ever or something similar to it will come back into service well y y Will something similar to Concorde come back into service? I think because technology and the effects of climate change have um, been dramatically kind of brought into the public eye so much over the last 40 years since, since, since Concorde, um, that I think future aviation is going to be much more about fuel efficiency, um, electric planes, if that's possible. Um, so the kind of old-fashioned jet might not be um, the, the, the preferred mode of transport. But, you know, looking to the future, there's going to be some very, very exciting developments in terms of how people travel through the air. Um, I mean, God knows what they are. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, just a, I'm just a layman. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I kind of saw something quite recently where they were kind of saying that airships might come back. You know, like the Hindenburg, you know, be a huge kind of airships traveling in their stately way, like a giant whale across the Atlantic. I mean, wouldn't that be great? Um, I doubt it. <laughs>